In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think we all know that St. Paul's Episcopal Church does not peddle in snake oil as seen on TV, Prosperity Gospel. If that's what you had a hankering for this morning, the lectionary did not oblige. If you have had the good fortune of never being exposed to this predatory theology, let me take a moment to loop you in. The dictionary definition of prosperity gospel is the belief among some Christians that God rewards those who live faithful lives with material wealth. What is not explored in this definition is the additional baggage that comes with what one may define as being faithful. Being faithful can mean following a moral code of how one treats people, how one constructs their values and engages in spiritual practices of consistent prayer, self-denial, and obedience. In, in the correct context, these practices can deepen one's relationship with God. But these practices become dangerous when manipulated to take advantage of people, as is done in the prosperity gospel. When bad things happen, one may be told to pray harder, give more money to the pastor, and blindly submit to the charismatic preacher's authority. Leverage your prayers like lottery tickets. The more you buy, it increases the odds of you winning. If you are hungry, cold, or naked, give the little you have and ignore your stomach pains. Don't question the oppressor whose boot is on your neck. Submit freely, and God will reward you. Or, at least, that is what the charlatan dealer of prosperity gospel claims. It could be easy for me to turn up my nose at those who fall prey to this predatory theology. But if I think about it, on some level, there is something quite comforting. The logic of, if I do X, then God will do X is almost simplistically reassuring. It would be easy to slip into idolatry by stripping God of all relationality. It would be easy to strip the narrative of scripture of all its complexities by turning God into a cosmic gumball machine that spits out blessings when you insert a quarter-sized prayer. In the reverse, it also answers the question of theodicy, of why God allows terrible things to happen in the world. Prosperity gospel would say that bad things happen because an individual or community lacks faith. While this leaves us with a very problematic understanding of the nature of God, it does give us a nice and tidy answer for the suffering we experience. However, this is not the God revealed in scripture or our lives. God is not a God who can be manipulated and twisted and bent to give us what we want when we want it. Nor is there, in albeit my limited estimation, a satisfactory philosophical response to why bad things happen. This morning, our lectionary weaves together a tapestry of God's greatness. The greatness of a God who is big enough to handle the cries of the despondent. A God who can handle a fist being shaken in their face. A God who is willing to be present in humanity's grief, frustration, and anger. And a God who calls God's faithful followers to do the same. In our Old Testament reading, we find ourselves in the book of Jeremiah, named after the priest and prophet of Judah. God called Jeremiah to warn the people of the southern kingdom of Judah to turn away from their idolatry of worshiping other gods and taking advantage of the poor, the children, and the widow. All of these things were a glaring violation of the Torah. God was not on the oppressor's side, and their wealth and material gain was a sign of their greed and idolatry, not God's divine blessing. 
Therefore, God raised up Jeremiah to speak out against the social injustices enacted by kings, other priests, and prophets. Jeremiah found himself in a very lonely and isolating position. Unsurprisingly, critiquing systemic oppression that allowed the elite few to accumulate and hoard extreme wealth, while a large majority went without, did not win Jeremiah many friends. Jeremiah had done what God had asked him to do, and what was his reward? Persecution. Overcome with anger and frustration over his situation, he lashes out at God. Jeremiah dares to complain to God when he says, I never sat around with those who go to wild parties. Why does my pain never end? Why is my wound so deep? Why can't I ever get well? To me, you are like a stream that runs dry. You are like a spring that doesn't have any water. Yikes. Jeremiah does not mince words. If the prosperity gospel was correct, then Jeremiah should have been flushed with cash, rolling in the moolah and doing a backstroke in a pile of money like Scrooge McDuck by this point. But he's not. Life is hard, challenging, and lonely, and he does not shy away from telling God how he feels. Jeremiah's honest lament is shocking, but what's even more shocking is God's response to Jeremiah. God does not rebuke Jeremiah for insubordination or whiz a lightning bolt past his head and bully him into submission. Instead, God makes space for Jeremiah's lament. God allows him to have motions of disappointment and anger. You could be looking at your Bible or bulletin right now and thinking, Mother Brittany, aren't you reading a lot into a simple paragraph break? I don't think so, and, and this is why. I have read this text within its canonical context. I'm asking the question, how is the God that is revealed to Jeremiah the same God that is revealed throughout the totality of Scripture? More specifically, how is the God revealed in Jer Jeremiah the same God revealed in the other pericopes appointed for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost? Our Gospel text reveals God as a God who would put on flesh, dwell among humanity, and be present with us in our pain and suffering. In Matthew 16, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the ultimate sign of a messianic display of human solidarity when he speaks to them about the time of his crucifixion. One of Jesus' close friends and disciples, Peter, cannot comprehend Jesus having to be betrayed and killed. Jesus must set Peter straight. Jesus' messianic mission was to all people, particularly the marginalized, reviled, and rejected. Death on the cross inflicted on the colonized, enslaved, imprisoned, and blasphemer would be the ultimate sign of human solidarity. To be one of Jesus' disciples means to follow Jesus' footsteps, to go to the world's forgotten places and bear witness to the ways God works among and within the lives of those often overlooked. Therefore, we know that God took a breath and sat with Jeremiah because we know it to be in the nature of God as revealed in the life of Christ. After a beat, God responds to Jeremiah. God responds to Jeremiah through an invitation of outstretched arms of faithful presence. God does not promise Jeremiah that being a prophet will get any easier, but God promises that he will never leave him. God says, I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you. To save you and deliver you, says the Lord, I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. So if you are looking for a prosperity gospel sermon, 
there was none to be had. And if you were looking for easy answers to the deep and meaningful question of why bad things happen, I'm afraid I have no easy answer for you. But I do know this. God is a God who is for us and working with us to bring about God's mission of good and perfect peace. And as we strive to this end, we trust that the Spirit of God will inspire us through hope. For we have a clear and certain hope that suffering and despair will not get the last word. Al Truesdale said, quote, Christian hope is not the same as optimism. Its basis is not the ups and downs of life. Hope's foundation is in the God who comes and will come. It is confidence that the same God who suffered in his son and raised him from the grave will finish what he started, end quote. This morning, if you find yourself angry like Jeremiah or perplexed like Peter, know that God is great enough to handle all your emotions. It is also my prayer that you will leave here a little less lonely, sad, or frustrated than when you came. For God has brought you to this place where you will be fed and nourished by the body of Christ and bound to this community in love. Amen. <laughs>